Good afternoon, everybody, or indeed, good morning or good evening if you're not watching this live during the conference. Uh, my name is Douglas Carr. I'm a PhD student at Newcastle University working in collaboration with English Heritage. Um, and today I'm going to talk about coins, specifically coins from beyond Hadrian's Wall, so from Northern England and from Southern Scotland. Uh, I apologise for appearing in profile. Uh, I have a laptop to the side recording and uh, a larger monitor that's easier to work with in front of me. Um, so what is my research on? Uh, my PhD is, is focused on doing a really comprehensive study of the coinage of Hadrian's Wall and its wider frontier zone. And obviously the first difficulty is actually defining what that frontier zone is. Um, and given that any definition I chose to use was ultimately going to be subjective. Um, I chose to make my own life easier and need to use modern administrative boundaries. So I'm covering North East England, so Northumberland, Tyne and Weir and County Durham, using Cumbria for the North West and Southern Scotland, so Dumfries and Galloway and the Scottish borders. There are about 56 thousand coins it's probably no surprise that quite a large number of coins from this part of the world um, the number fluctuates a bit depending on on how things are recorded in the database but it's, it's around 56,000 and those are coming from hordes excavations and just casual finds um, the aim of my research is to examine supply usage and loss of coinage in, in the frontier zone and the basis for this is a really large access database that I am still currently working on um, that contains details of all the finds of coins and details of the coins themselves. Um, I want to stress at this point the database isn't finished uh, and this is going to be apparent during the presentation and um, there are bits of data that you might expect to see there that are not going to be there. Uh, for instance, Cumbria isn't recorded yet uh, in its entirety so it's not featured. Uh, and the PAS data hasn't been added into the database yet either, so that won't appear. Um, so today then I'm going to talk briefly through uh, a timeline of the frontier um, and it kind of flashes up a few periods where we might expect to see changes in the coin profiles for sites, casual finds, hordes. Uh, I'm going to talk about site finds, I'm going to talk about hordes and then finally I'm going to talk about the casual finds. So the northern frontier of Roman Britain then. So we kick off in about AD 71 uh, with the annexation of the Brigantes. We get the arrival of Agricola as governor, uh, Agricola's campaigns in Scotland, withdrawal to the Stain Gate. Then at the beginning of the Hadrian's reign, there was apparently some trouble in Britain. Then we get the construction of Hadrian's Wall starting. A bit later in Hadrian's reign, there is a uh, expedition to Britain. Um, and then we see the Antonine advance into Scotland with the, and the establishment of the Antonine Wall. We then see the withdrawal from the Antonine Wall back to Hadrian's Wall. And at some point during the reign of Marcus Aurelius, there, is, there are forces dispatched to Britain because of the threat of war. Uh, in the reign of Commodus, there is an, apparently an incursion across Hadrian's Wall. There are several defeats and eventually victory is secured by Ulpius Marcellus. Just to circle it back to coins for a minute. Uh, on the screen there are a couple of issues. Uh, so the top one is kind of Antonius Pius with the Britannia reverse and the bottom one is an issue of Commodus with Vict Brit at the bottom one. Now, I know that's a little bit difficult to see. So following the death of Commodus uh, we see the army in Britain supporting Claudius Albinus uh, in the civil wars that follow uh, with at least a portion of the British forces going to Gaul to fight at Lyon against Plinius Severus where they're defeated. Following this there are apparently disturbances north of Hadrian's Wall and apparently peace is bought. Following this we have the Severian campaigns and then things go a little bit quiet through the third century uh, until Constantius I, that's the father of Constantine the Great, uh, apparently campaigns against the Caledoni and the Picts. Uh, then in the 340s, Constans, uh, one of the sons of Constantine the Great, 
uh, pops up and has some dealings with uh, the Stouts of the Northern Frontier. What exactly those dealings were is, is rather obscure. Um, in the 360s, we start off with um, beginning Scots and Picts laying waste to land in the frontier. And then towards the end of the 360s, we have the Barbarian Conspiracy, where attacks by Scots, Picts, Ascotty and Saxons occur throughout Britain and Hadrian's War is overrun. Uh, then in the 380s, before he goes off to go and try and claim the Western Empire, Magnus Maximus defeats the Picts and the Scots. And then right at the end of the 4th century, Stilicho or a subordinate campaigns against the Picts and the Scots. These are all events that are sort of supposed to happen. You know, I'm, I'm not really here to argue for or against any of them, and there are people far better qualified than I to do so. All they are is they represent periods where we might expect to see a greater amount of coinage showing up, um, or at least changes in the profile of coinage. Moving on to talk about sites then. Uh, there is a bit of a problem here, and that's largely to do with the size of coin assemblages. Obviously, there are forces in, Scotland, in southern Scotland and North Vedrians will with coin sequences. The difficulty is they're generally not big enough to allow fair comparisons between sites. The only one really big enough is Newstead. Uh, Burns, for example, which is on here, has 55 coins. Um, we realistically want about 100 uh, to be able to do a fair comparison. Um, and perhaps unsurprisingly, we see a Flavian through to Antonine peak in the coinage represented in that profile. Um, those early coins, so the ones to four, AD 41, are largely Republican denarii that are just still in circulation. Um, I'm just going to bring in Springwood. So Springwood isn't a site as such, it's a quite a large group of coins, 285 to be exact. Um, it, it's a bit odd. There's no, as far as I'm aware, period appropriate site that's been identified there. There is just this large group of coins, all of which are copper alloy, um, and they don't really fit as a hoard. Maybe three hoards, but the what I'm aware of the circumstances of the find don't really seem to support that. Um, and because they're all copper alloy, I struggle to see it in you know as a as a subsidy, as a bribe, as protection money, as loot, uh, or your other similar descriptor of choice. Um, it looks to me like monetary economic activity, um, given that it's copper alloy coinage, which just doesn't have the same intrinsic value um, as either gold or silver coins do. Um, there's a group of finds from Great Whittington that Rob Collins has discussed in Archaeologia Aeliana um, and has interpreted it, it's just site just north of Hadrian's Wall of Great Whittington, and it's interpreted as a possible trade site. And I think maybe we're seeing something similar at Springwood. I'm not however going to nail my colours to the mast on that one. Um, it's just an interestingly large and an interestingly late group of copper alloy coinage from southern Scotland. Um, so just a few comparators then, so looking first at the Antonine Wall, um, the data for which is pulled from Richard Abdi's paper in Britannia, um, and the beginning peak isn't quite as strong in the Flavian period as say Newstead, um, but we're seeing realistically and unsurprisingly the same first, second century period of activity with the old later coin. Um, and again, Springwood doesn't really fit in with those profiles. So moving on to compare with a couple of wall sites. Um, Unsurprisingly, both Bird Oswald and Houghton Chesters were seeing generally less spiking because we have a longer coin sequence that goes on into the third and the fourth centuries. And Springwood's perhaps falling in a little bit more closely with um, the Bird Oswald and Houghton Chesters profiles than it does with um, the other sites in Scotland. So looking at a couple of sites from south of the wall, uh, so we have Binchester and Corbridge, um, and we again don't see those, those big early peaks, uh, and we see that third and fourth century continuation um, for the coins from those sites. 
Perhaps, perhaps then, unsurprisingly, it, it can really be boiled down to coins in sites north of the wall are going to be first and second century. That's when we're seeing the sites. That's when we're going to see the coins. So moving on to talk about hordes then. So we're not we're not dealing with with very large numbers of hordes. We're dealing with uh, so twenty one definite hordes, two groups of coins that are almost certainly hordes, and a couple of hordes that just don't have very much detailed information on them. So there's twenty five in total. And by time period, so we're looking at um, four from the first century, nine from the second century, three, uh, sorry four from the third century uh, and five from the fourth century and then three hordes that are uncertain. Um, I don't think there's a great deal to say about the distribution of these hordes. Um, I think it's noticeable that there are these couple in the on the far west coast of Scotland in the fourth century um, and that's something I'm going to bring up a little bit later in the casual points. Essentially, I, I hadn't given a great deal of consideration before I started the PhD and started plugging uh, coins onto maps to to really thinking about movement across the Irish Sea between the northwest and um, southwest Scotland in the period tended to always think about things going north south through Hadrian's Wall rather than thinking about the coastal route as well and it's a little bit easier to see with the casual finds that there is a, a sort of coastal spread. Um, so looking at the coins uh, in these hordes, looking at the latest dated coin for each horde, um, we again we've got that sort of Flavian peak, um, really carrying on until the third century, um, with a, again a bit of a peak in the mid fourth century. Comparing that with with hordes south of Hadrian's Wall, then um, seeing a slightly later peak. Uh, at the beginning for those hordes, uh, you know, shock horror beginning with uh, hordes where the latest dated coin is one of Hadrian. Um, but we're seeing that same decline into the first half of the third century, but with a substantially stronger late third and fourth century profile as well. Looking at the size of hordes, um, we're not really dealing with very large numbers most of the time. Um, it's not really until the reign of Antonius Pius that we, we really shoot up in terms of uh, numbers of coins in a particular hoard. Uh, it drops a bit in the reign of Marcus Aurelius, but then uh, comes back up again with Commodus and Septimius Severus. Uh, and then uh, plugging in the hordes from south of the wall as a comparator. Um, again, we see a kind of peak of larger hordes throughout period seven through to period 10. Um, but again, we have a, a longer spread and perhaps a more even spread into the third and fourth century. Uh, looking at the composition then of these hordes, uh, we're dealing with, um, I think, quite a marked difference. Um, there is a preference, I think, north of the wall for precious metal. Um, and I'm going to switch the pie charts just to just to, I think make that a little bit clearer. So comparing kind of precious metal hordes only, copper hordes only, and then mixed precious metal and copper hordes. It's pretty clear I think that in Scotland there is a marked preference for precious metal. Um, south of the wall, over half of the hordes are copper alloy only. Um, whereas north of the wall, the picture is rather different. And if we regard hoards as stores of value, either deposited for economic, votive, or political reasons, whatever, whatever reason, there is a a noticeable preference in Scotland for precious metal. And it raises interesting points then about how coinage is perceived north of the wall. Given that copper alloy doesn't have that intrinsic value as coin as a coin that, say, gold or silver coinage has, um, we're perhaps seeing south of the wall a more widespread acceptance of a currency system 
and I use that word loosely um, use the word system loosely I should say um, north of the wall we are perhaps seeing coins regarded as rather than part of a currency system as just conveniently shaped and sized pieces of precious metal. So kind of moving on then to talk about the casual finds. So casual finds, we're really covering a very wide variety of finds, um, everything from metal detectorist finds through antiquarian reports, um, coins found in gardens, and even one I believe that is reported as being found in the mud of a farmer's boot. Um, again, the northeast is going to look a little bit sparse north of the wall, and that is purely because the PAS data hasn't been added in. There are coins on the PAS from north there, it's just not possible to add them in yet. Um, in terms of distribution, we're really looking at two noticeable groups in Scotland. There's a, there's a sort of southwest scatter, but there's a fairly concentrated group in eastern um, southern Scotland with a kind of scatter around it going off towards the east and the north. Um, and I think it's slightly clearer here when I was talking about this, this coastal distribution in the southwest of Scotland. That there's just a a little bit more from the casual finds, I think, for that. So chronologically, then, we're dealing with a far greater spread with the casual finds um, than we see either, I think, with sites or hordes. Um, the profiles aren't, I don't think, really horrendously different to north and south of the wall. Um, bar a couple of things that sort of early peak, and especially with kind of, I think, uh, sort of Republican denarii, I think, are quite popular. It's in that 2 AD 41. Um, I think perhaps the most interesting thing looking at the chronology of the casual finds is that that severe and peak, we know supposedly the peace have bought north of the border, so obviously something went north of the border, probably coined. Um, and the idea that there's campaigning, there's lots of soldiers moving about more likely to drop coins. We don't see a, a peak in the Severan period, not the war. Surprisingly, um, we would perhaps expect to see one there. Uh, there's, there's actually very little. Uh, but south of the wall, we see a really noticeable peak. Uh, you know, you compare these with the reigns of Commodus, um, and yeah, there's quite a, a definite spike there south of the wall. Um, but not north of the wall, which is interesting. Um, putting those casual finds up against Corbridge, uh, almost the opposite in that we have our peaks later into the third and fourth century, perhaps unsurprisingly. Uh, in terms of what coins are being lost, uh, we're essentially looking over time at the growing power of copper, um, really just the growing number of copper coins probably in circulation through the third and fourth century relative to silver and gold. Um, you know, we see that declining chunk of silver and gold in the distribution uh, through from heavy domination by silver in the first century all the way through to um, entirely copper alloy in the fourth century. Um, and that, that's again interesting because copper coin it has a it has an in, uh, it doesn't have an intrinsic value as, as precious metal in the same way that gold and silver does. It has uh, a monetary value, if you like. So to kind of finish up then, a uh, few key points. Um, it's difficult to observe uh, with sites much beyond that first and second century. Uh, sustained activity is kind of unsurprising, really. That's, that's when the sites are. Um, the later sites are perhaps more visible through things like coins and artifact spreads than through the physical remains of the sites themselves. Um, hordes, we're largely looking at first or second century, and we're looking at a preference for precious metal, um, especially notably so compared with the south of the wall. Uh, casual finds an earlier peak, but with stronger third and fourth century representation than sites or hordes. Um, 
I'm aware I'm not there to answer questions today, so if anybody does have any really burning questions, please do feel free to uh, drop me a line. My email address is at the bottom of the screen. Um, it only remains for me to say thank you uh, very much to the organisers for putting together a really great conference. Thank you to you all for listening. Thank you.